This is me. This is my beloved wife, Sylvia. This is Sylvia's idea of sailing. This is my dream of sailing and my hope of circumnavigating the globe as a retirement project in 2029. This is Sylvia's reaction to that idea. What? You got a plan. I am on a six year quest to convince Sylvia that a circumnavigation is a wonderful adventure, but the clock is ticking. So join me as I search for the perfect yacht that Sylvia will love and get all your ladies to subscribe and cheer Sylvia on in the comments. Welcome back to Naval Gazing at Camp David. This week, we head to South Africa and the yards of Phoenix Marine, who manufacture the innovative, exquisite 5X Plus. Today, we are going to one, review its specifications, pricing and layout against three similar new vessels. Two, do a full tour asking, what would Sylvia say? Three, naval gaze and innovation and or adjustment that might make life aboard just a little bit easier. Four, have a look at the used market for three to five year old pre-owned comparables. And five, finally give it a Dave score and compare the result with all our previously reviewed yachts. All this fun will be sandwiched between a pairing of wine and a work of art from the same region as the guest yacht in an effort to capture the culture and people who give birth to these wonderful vessels. Wine, waves, art and ideas. What a great way to spend 30 minutes. So let's get going. From high above Vancouver, we head east across the continent, the Atlantic and all the way across France to its Mediterranean shores and the home of last week's guest yacht, the Gunboat 57 in picturesque Le Grand Mont. From here, we head way south down the western side of South Africa and the yards of Phoenix Marine where each exquisite X5 is born. Finally, we head southeast to the Stellenbach wine region for our wine pairing this week, the Stellenbach Mentors Cabernet Franc 2018 by KWV. With access to grapes from more than 50 farms and 400 vineyard sites across the Western Cape's Parle, Stellenbach, Swartland, Perdberg, Malzenberg, Darling, Ellen, Robertson and Wellington regions, KWV's ability as a commercial producer to source the finest quality grapes for a premium expression of the Cape Wineland is unrivaled. The winemaking team handle the grapes expertly before and during transport to KWV's cellar facilities in Parle. This site covers nearly 32 hectares, at the heart of which stands KWV's imposing cathedral cellar, built in 1930. Oh, that's delicious. I think you're gonna enjoy, enjoy that. Cheers, let's go have a look at that boat. Having a look at this vessel, if you hear any hesitation in my voice, it's nothing to do with the actual practicality and technical excellence. It's more the aesthetic. It's not my thing, but there are many who love it. Uh, the, the, it has many flowing curves. You can see that wide um, aft support to the uh, bimini, the hard bimini, which also now houses some beautiful tiltable solar panels so you can get the exact angle to the sun. Um, what is housed in this format is absolute technical brilliance and a, a philosophy of a complete saleable boat as opposed to almost a kit boat which the other manufacturers go for once you actually get into their uh, uh, option list. So, new comparables. What are we going to look at? We are looking at the Wave 50, the Sunry 50, the Lagoon 51, and the Exquisite X5 Plus. The uh, Looking here at their profiles, you can see that the Wave 50 is as avant-garde, shall we say, as is the Exquisite X5 Plus. Uh, the uh, Sunry 50 
Uh, certainly not a traditional looking boat in the truest sense, but uh, a, a very uh, elegant line to it for a boat of this girth. Uh, the Lagoon 51, again, um, it, it actually looks slim compared to the uh, Sun Reef 50, certainly the Wave 50, uh, and that is saying something. Looking at upwind sail area, uh, the leader in this, and it has to be, is of course the Sun Reef at 159 square meters, followed by the Lagoon at 150 square meters, and then the Exquisite, 144, finally the Wave 50 at 139. Heading down onto the cabin top, we see three out of the four actually have a full fly bridge. Uh, the Wave 50 um, is way up in the air, and you'll see why if once you get inside. We did a, a review of this some time back. Uh, those expansive picture windows uh, really raise up that uh, cabin top. Sun Reef 50 at a more average height along with the Lagoon 51. Uh, the Sun Reef 50 does have acres of space up there. Um, it is a true entertainer's paradise. And the Lagoon 51, they, they actually finally uh, fixed up that flybridge uh, from the 50 and put a, uh, a proper settee table set up there. So it's very nice. Uh, the Exquisite X5 Plus, uh, it, it doesn't uh, deal with those frivolities of a flybridge or fly lounge. Uh, it has solar panels, massive real glass, uh, like the balance, solar panels that deliver a huge amount of power. Uh, and in fact, those aft solar panels are tiltable, so you can nail down the exact angle. Overall, in pricing, uh, we see that the uh, Sun Reef is the highest at 1.7, followed by the Exquisite at 1.547. Now, sidebar that for a little bit, because the Exquisite is one of those very few that don't adhere to the rule of the 50% on top for sail away. I could only find maximum, with every single option on their list, an additional 129,000 to put on top that base. So uh, just bear this in mind. It looks to be second most expensive, but it really isn't. Um, and then the Wave at 1.3 and the Lagoon at 1.1 million. Heading into the saloon and the cockpit, uh, <laughs> the Wave 50 uh, is freaking staggering. Uh, this feels like a 60, 70 foot cap when you get on board. Uh, I don't really quite completely understand how they pulled it off, but the sense of space is monumental. Uh, and then you've got that covered uh, walkthrough front um, cockpit, which is really quite spectacular. But there are practical elements to it that, uh, that you give up uh, when, you, when you do that kind of space allocation. Sun Reef 50, much more traditional, uh, but again, with a walk through to the front cockpit. Uh, Lagoon 51, um, you've got the mock uh, front cockpit, no walk through. Uh, a very, very comfortable saloon, very, very comfortable outdoor cockpit you can see there. Uh, and then you've got the Exquisite X5, which again has... If you look at the dimensions of that, an extremely large indoor area for a 51, 53 foot yacht, depending on how you measure it out. Um, lots of space in the saloon, lots of comfort, massive, massive outdoor cockpit. Probably, uh, I would say glancing at this, definitely the largest uh, um, aft cockpit of the group by probably 30% by the looks of it. Looking at the uh, weight factor here, we have Big Bertha here, the Sunry 50 at 32 tons. Wow. Uh, the next one, uh, looking, believe it or not, svelte compared to the Sunry 50, is the Lagoon 51 at 19.9 tons, followed by the Exquisite, a 53-foot yacht at 16.5 uh, tons, which is pretty darn good, and the Wave 50 that uses a lot more carbon at 15 tons. Heading down into the accommodations now, uh, looking at the Wave 50 here, uh, you, surprisingly you don't have an athwartship walk around um, berth for the owner in a boat of this size. Uh, it is fore aft. You have some access up the sides. Um, the Sun Reef 50, um, massive walk around berths all over the place, uh, all athwartship. 
Uh, the Lagoon 51, always a very comfortable environment. Uh, and although it isn't a thwart ship, the, the berth is walk around um, and you'd have full access up both sides. Uh, something which, uh, you know, I'd appreciate. And although Sylvia looked at it and said, well, that's cramped. But I think she's just used to looking at her bedroom. On the Exquisite, you have a fore-aft um, with uh, a modest access up either side. Um, but uh, again, I extremely comfortable within those hulls. As far as the overall footprint goes, it's the uh, Exquisite at 16.2 by 7.2. As, as far as uh, length goes, it, it, it has it. As far as beam goes, the Sunreef has it at a monumental 9.1 versus uh, a length of 15.2. Um, then you've got the, uh, the Lagoon at 15.4 by 8.1, and finally the Wave at 14.95 by 8.34. But I assure you, inside that Wave, it feels like it's the largest of the bunch. Again, surprising amount of space, although you sort of pay for it in aesthetic and access to that boom up top. Heading to the numbers. Um, looking across the top line, we've already identified that the Lagoon was the lowest cost on the base price uh, with Sunreef at the top and Exquisite a second. Now, let's take a gander down then at the sail away in U.S. dollars. So um, U.S. dollars, as far as uh, the, the actual uh, base price goes, again, you've got the Sunreef in the lead at 1.853, followed by the Exquisite at 1.7, the Wave at 1.423, and the Lagoon at 1.199. But when you get down to the sail away price, again, Tomash and his team over there do not believe in the traditional European format where you have a base price with a stripped-down beast that really couldn't go anywhere without the options. And then you have to add on at least 50% worth of options. I scanned their price list, and I could only find including everything else there as far as the factory pickup goes, another 129000 on top of the 1.7. So I'm going to say your sail away price for the exquisite uh, 5X plus is $1.8 million. So that puts it basically at the same sail away as the Lagoon 51. Now your exquisite 5X plus is a very customizable vessel with premium materials uh, and premium technology, uh, it, it, I mean, there's, there's simply no question there which one you'd go with. Uh, I mean, save for any aesthetic concern you might have, but I'm sorry, the sheer um, amount of technology and quality and customization that Tomash and his team have put into this vessel, it, 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 could, be, it could be dressed in sackcloth and you'd still have to go with it. Um, looking at the rest of them, you can see, again, the Sun Reef uh, tops out at about uh, 2.8 million and the Wave at about uh, 2.1, which is kind of surprising for the technology and build uh, type that's on that Wave. Looking down further, length overall, of course, it's your exquisite in the lead at 53 foot. Uh, draft, uh, there's a surprise. It's the exquisite in the lead at the lowest draft of 1.35 meters or 4.5 feet. Uh, the next one there is the Lagoon at 4.6 feet. Displacement, uh, the least is the Wave at uh, 15 ton or 33,000 pounds. Um, and the upwind sail area, we already identified the Sun Reef uh, is in the lead, but has to be at that weight um, uh, at 159 uh, square meters. As we head down then, into the uh, horsepower, it's about the same across. The wave is a little different in that it is a, a hybrid drive. Uh, and then your fuel and uh, fresh water, it's the Lagoon in the lead at 1,040 with water. Uh, followed, I would say, by the Sun Reef, then the, the Wave 50 and the Exquisite 5X Plus, but we're, we're talking fractions of a difference here. Into the performance indicators, um, looking at hull material, here's where you start to see that glorious quality and the attention to detail that Tomash and uh, the Exquisite team have here. Sandwiched composite construction using quadraxial stitched fabrics, uh, Divini cell composite PVC foam, and epoxy vinyl ester resin. Epoxy vinyl ester. We're not going vinyl ester polyester. This is going one up. 
uh, e well, two up, epoxy vinyl ester. Uh, the next one is going to be uh, the Wave 50, which is vacuum infused vinyl ester and e glass on foam core with carbon fiber reinforcements. So it does have that to it, which uh, contributes to its weight, and it is using pure, pure vinyl ester, which is a very, very nice material. Um, the uh, Sunry 50, I am trying to qualify exactly what their hull material is. Uh, it's a little challenging. There's nothing on the internet. I've contacted the manufacturer. The representatives didn't know what it was, which is a little daunting in, to say the least. But you're looking at um, the deck, hull, structural bulkheads, and upper cockpit vacuum infused sandwich of laminate, Corsell foam, and a polyester vinyl ester resin. I don't know exactly what the fiber is, and I don't have confirmation exactly what the resin is, because some places it says vinyl ester, some places it says polyester, some places it even said epoxy. So um, I will get that and update you. Uh, the Lagoon 51, uh, the traditional Lagoon Beneteau style of vacuum infused polyester and glass, solid fiberglass below the waterline with balsa core above the waterline and on deck. So by far the exquisite 5X plus wins on hull quality. This is a multi-generational vessel. As we head into sail area to displacement, uh, the leader here is, and this is indicative of power, the leader here is the Wave 50 at 23.2. Now it is followed very closely by the Exquisite at 22.6. Uh, heading to displacement to hull length, which is indicative of weight. Here low number wins, uh, and that is the Wave 50 at 125.5. Uh, followed very closely again by the Exquisite at 129.9. Uh, next is going to be the Lagoon at 188.8 and Big Bertha, the Sunry 50 at 284.78. I think that's the biggest number I've ever seen. Um, going into the comfort ratio, uh, because of its weight, the Sunry 50 leads at 24.2, uh, followed by the Lagoon at 17.5, the Exquisite at 14.4, and the Wave 50 at 13. Hull speed uh, is simply a factor of hull length, and of course the leader there is the exquisite at 9.48. Now, looking at the uh, KSP number, which would indicate theoretical speed at 10 knots of wind, uh, you're seeing that the leader is the Wave 50 at 74% uh, of wind speed, or 7.4 knots at 10 knots of wind, uh, followed within a knot. Uh, by the exquisite 5X plus at 73% of wind speed uh, or 7.3 knots at uh, 10 knots of wind. Hopping on board, what would Sylvia say? You know, I don't really know what Sylvia, I know what she'd say to the overall boat and the space and everything. I'm not sure what she'd say to the external aesthetic. Um, but there's just so much to love about this boat. Not just the boat, honestly, the culture of the people who build it. Tamash and his team are just the nicest people you'd ever want to meet. I mean, your sense of trust with them is immediate and complete. Uh, look at the, uh, the, extend, the extender on the hardtop that houses those tiltable solar panels. It's really quite exceptional. Um, really giving you a lot of living space. Uh, the the um, sugar scoops, nice and wide, very comfortable, uh, integrated uh, ladder out to the water. Uh, and look at that, you've got a, a furling boom. Now, I've heard all sorts of wild stuff, and most recently on La Vagabond, people hating on furling booms, but Tamash knows what he's doing there, and he's actually putting a camera so that you can monitor the furl as that boom rolls, because the only thing you need to do is tilt it up or down so that it rolls properly, just like a carpet, and if you can see it, you can do it. So Tamash has got that all figured out as well. So heading on board here, look at these solid steel uh, handrails. Absolutely love it. Look at the tilt-ups here we've got um, on the aft settee. Look at me trying to get onto the boat. Uh, so uh, the, the tilt-ups are fantastic, creating a wonderful um, area for relaxation. And then look at that, built-in dive tank holders. I mean, and of course you've got your dive compressor in there. You quickly saw the fan on that. 
Uh, but I mean, isn't this an innovative? I mean, it's expansive. This this the size of this aft settee, and so comfortable. Looking up there, you've got beautiful finishes on the bottom of the bimini. I love that waterfall shower. All of your your um, your uh, uh, clears are rolled up and tight away. Um, you've got not just settees, but uh, movable footstools, uh, beautiful inset lighting, the refrigerator there, easy access to the dinghy, or sorry, not the dinghy, but the life raft, um, and a beautiful table in there. So let's head up the weather decks on the port side. Look at these solid steel rails. I freaking love it. And then that boarding ladder, just like you have on a monohull. Absolutely fantastic. Look at this rigid, beautiful, uh, hardened glass windshield. Lots of handholds. I mean, the guys at, um, uh, I hope uh, Le Vagabond is watching this because they, they weren't happy that I wasn't mentioning safety. Well, here is safety. That rail along the hard top goes all the way back. You've got water catchment here for water. Uh, you've got, um, do they call those granny bars at the base of the, uh, the mast there? Um, nice area for seating up here. I, I, I'd like to see some factory um, cushions that turn this into a bit of a faux cockpit. I'm sure you could have it done, uh, but I just get so excited when I see these solid handrails. It's it's like the, the uh, catamaran answer to uh, um, ML. Uh, now, here is beauty. Look at these power furlers, and not only do you have two of them, but you actually now have optional a third for your head sail, like we've talked about several times back. So three sails, power furlers, all uh, controllable from the uh, helm. And uh, it's a raised mid-helm, so you have full uh, contact with, uh, you know, the, the folks uh, below while you're uh, sailing the boat. Um, and again, every part of this boat feels overbuilt, feels incredibly durable. Uh, and now act I actually heard that um, uh, the folks over at Balance are going to start offering that uh, head sail, the, the very uh, code sail furler uh, as an option on theirs as well. Here again, look at this beautiful drop down access ladder, all that Har, you know, the, the solid uh, side rails, absolutely love it. Um, let's move on back into the cockpit. We'll take a, oh, look at these. Here are the solar panels. So these panels are glass. These are not, they're walk-on glass. Uh, 2,280 watts. So 2.3 kilowatt hours of solar and they are the long-lasting, high-quality glass that Phil Berman over at Balance is, is talking about on a regular basis. Plus, the aft ones tilt up to get an exact angle to the sun for you. So, again, Tamash has thought of it all here. Uh, two tables, not just one. You can see pads on that one table. Beautiful um, helm seat. Lots of uh, set-in uh, sound system speakers, all that good stuff. Um, we're going to just head up to the helm space here. You can see your foot controls for all of your electric winches. Um, and you can see uh, the size of the winches is really good for the vessel itself. Um, all of your, uh, your um, oh, for goodness sakes, the thingies that lock the lines down. Why is my mind blanking on me here? Um, clutches. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so they're all there. You, you not only have foot controls for your winches, you have hand controls for your winches. Everything is beautifully done here. And, uh, I mean, it is for comfortable, safe sailing. It, there is no doubt that Sylvia would feel comfortable within this boat in, in the same way that our friend Rob Poirier was talking about on The Privilege. This frame for the Bimini is rather interesting. Uh, a bit of a curve again, not wild about the aesthetic, but functionally it does the job. It has a beautiful hard windscreen up there, which is going to keep you nice and cozy, and um, you're not going to have any worries. Now, speaking of comfort and security, the one thing that freaks me out most about sailing or boating of any sort is lightning. 
Uh, when I'm out even on the lake and there's uh, lightning and thunder around, I am nervous and I can only imagine uh, how an anxiety filled Sylvia would be. So the question is, is there a way to deal with this? Well, we've all watched the poor folks on Parlay Revival deal with them. not one, but two lightning strikes. Um, we've heard from the winds about the uh, cost of a lightning strike and the time it takes, you know, upwards of $30,000, eight months on the hard, and then you're not sure if you've caught everything. Um, you know, not to mention the sheer danger of it. And we're not just talking about direct lightning strikes. We're talking about indirect lightning strikes that you may not even know have affected your boat until it's too late and just as costly. So what's that worth to you? In my mind, that's worth an awful lot of money simply because of, you know, who I am and who Sylvia is. This is worth a pile of cash to avoid. But how do you avoid massive discharges of this magnitude. You, you can't control them. You can't direct them into the water effectively. They're going to burn stuff up as they go down your mast and through your hull, no matter what you do. It's just too powerful. You have to somehow avoid it. And that is the technology we're looking at here today. This little gizmo that looks like a stainless steel mushroom and this little gizmo that looks like a standard filter go together in a configuration that actually protects you from lightning strikes at all. Now, lightning is a natural phenomenon in which electrical charges that accumulate on the clouds are discharged to the ground when the lightning strike connects to the mast, or what they call an ascending leader releasing an enormous current that can't be underscored enough. This is called neutralization or instantaneous compensation of the electrical field or disaster. Traditional lightning protection tools use a lightning rod, cables and grounding materials on the bottom of the hull to try and conduct that huge amount of current to the ground with as little damage to the vessel as possible but a direct lightning strike is only half the equation. The high frequency electricity that forms from even an indirect strike near your vessel can travel through the water and the air and still cause catastrophic damage to electronics and boat systems. According to reports from Boat US Marine Insurance Claim Files, the odds of your boat being struck by lightning in any year are about one in a thousand. Some states, such as Idaho, have no lightning claims. But for those of you with boats in Florida, nobody has to tell you that the odds there are greater, much greater. 33% of all lightning claims are from the Sunshine State, and the strike rate there is 3.3 boats per thousand. Not surprisingly, the majority of strikes are on sailboats, four per thousand. But power boats get struck also, five per 10,000. Trawlers have the highest rate for power boats, two per 1,000. And lightning has struck houseboats, bass boats, and even PWCs. Lightning strike repairs tend to be expensive and time consuming. NOAA estimates a strike contains around 30 million volts. And a quick zap to a 12 volt device will certainly destroy it. But lightning is like horseshoes. Close does count. There can sometimes be collateral damage when a nearby boat gets hit, either the result of the lightning's powerful electromagnetic, electromagnetic field or the current induced by the field running through the boat's shore power cord. This can create strange problems. Some electronics may work fine, others that are adjacent may not, and still others may only work partially. In some cases, compasses have been off by 100 degrees. Repair costs are significant, and typical repair times are from six to eight months. Owners are without their boats for extended periods, but continue to pay crew, dockage, insurance, and other ongoing expenses. The unit we're looking at today operates just a little differently as opposed to trying to control or redirect the massive energy of a direct lightning strike. The lightning suppressor is designed to prevent the direct impact of lightning on the protected boat. 
Theoretically, it does this by collecting the positive charges that flow from the surrounding area and from the grounding plate on the bottom of the unit, and the negative charges from the atmosphere on the upper part of the unit. Both positive and negative charges are neutralized gradually, sending weak current back to the grounding plate. The continuous repetition of this process 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, slowly and continuously compensates the electrical field, preventing the creation of an ascending leader or a lightning rod or turning your mast into ascending leader which eliminates the conditions needed for a direct lightning strike on the protected sailboat. The DDCE is a system of protection against atmospheric discharges and an electromagnetic protector that avoids the impact of the lightning strike on the protected structure. To protect the electronic equipment from the indirect effects of near lightning strikes, or EMPs, a high reactance filter or DNNFT model DINFIL ground filter is installed to shield against high frequency ground induced surges from atmospheric discharges, i.e. lightning, electromagnetic pulses and other sources. The unit reduces the high frequencies and the remaining low frequencies are discharged to ground by a surge protector. With more than 8,000 units installed worldwide, DDCE has been implemented on a variety of structures over 37 countries around the world. The unit has been tested by the Laboratory of Electrical Engineering at the University of Pau, France. Additionally, the full line of devices are tested on the official Central Electrotechnical Laboratory of the Spanish Ministry of Industry to demonstrate that the equipment works properly. Just to have a quick look at some of the long-term studies that have been done. So in a nutshell, it's been laboratory tested with as big a charge as, as can be artificially induced within a controlled environment. And what they have also done is they've selected th multiple sites and they have installed uh, in, in high strike areas. And you'll see what I mean when you see the charts. And they have installed the unit on these... Uh, in, on these uh, structures, uh, the, these high exposure structures in high strike regions, and over a long period of time, sometimes 15 years, they have tested to see how many strikes to the site have been made. So let's have a quick look at that. First up is Las Pardenas Telecommunication Tower. This is a study that went for 17 years, from 2003 to 2019. And you can see here that um, the number of direct strikes within 1.25 miles around the tower over that period was 1,609. There were zero on the site that was protected. The next one is Amet Weather Radar. And this was a 10-year study from 2010 to 2019. Here, you have 430 strikes in a 1.25 mile radius around the tower and zero strikes on the tower. Finally, we've got a telecom telecommunications tower in Pictagoma, uh, and this was a five-year study from 2015 to 2019. Here, in that period of only five, uh, five years, or three years, sorry, you had 1,546 strikes in a 1.25 mile radius around this site, and you had zero strikes on the site. Now, it's tough to prove a negative, but this is certainly uh, uh, convincing evidence, all told, when you look at it. And what's the cost? About $55,000 for a boat that I'd want. Is it worth $55,000 to me over a five-year period? That's about $1,100 a year to prevent. Uh, basically, if we got struck by lightning, Sylvie would hop on an aircraft and head home, and that would be the end of our trip. So, yes, it would be worth it to me. Is it to you? Hopping back on board here, uh, just scanning the visibility of your hulls, uh, from the helm, and it's really good, both uh, forward and aft. Uh, now down into the cockpit, you can see even in the cockpit, you have beautiful matching Corian countertops, very nice. Uh, lovely outdoor fridges. There's obviously access to a beautiful grill under there and a sink. 
Um, you've got all the toys that you'd ever want. And oh, I love that. There's that beautiful backlit logo. Why do people spend millions on boats and put stickers on them? I love that one. So looking around here, you get a sense of the sheer space. That is a big island there. And you, you not only have one, you've got a couple here. This one houses the, uh, the, the Rise Up TV, uh, plus all of these drawers. Now, if you haven't seen it, and I'm not sure if I show it on here, you've got Tamasha's tool drawer somewhere in here where you just uh, pull it out and it has comes with the boat a full set of tools that you're going to need. Obviously, you can see full induction tops, all electricity. We don't have any gas on this boat. Uh, lovely settee. Um, you've got vent windows in the uh, forward windows there. All of your windows are hardened glass. There's, uh, and you're not going to get any grazing on this. A massive desk slash uh, nav station there. Um, I, again, I, I'm not a big fan of the aesthetic on, on the trim uh, or, or the back on that nav station, but the technology and the practicality and the equipment and quality put into this, you just can't avoid it. Um, again, I, I'm not a big fan of this particular wood trim. Uh, again, that sort of bleachy thing happening. But uh, Tamash tells me I can get anything I want on this. Uh, for a boat that's going to cost me sail away the same as a Lagoon 51. Why wouldn't I do it? Um, beautiful, beautiful head here. Uh, and you've got a, a, a perfect a separate shower the door opens uh, to seal off that area. Very innovative, uh, giving a sense of space and an openness, even though it's a, uh, a side hull um, um, ber uh, head. Uh, now, I'm sure you've seen the multiplicity of other videos that shows that panel on the side of the bed opens up and gives you access to all your electronics. Of course, the windows give you massive light into all of these spaces. Um, and your, uh, uh, your storage, uh, the, the one thing I love about Tomash here is he doesn't put open shelves beside that bed like so many other lazy manufacturers do. I hate open shelves. They look messy. They look cluttered. They never look any good. That is my anal retentive side. I would have a, a, a door on every shelf if I could, and that's what he's done. So, um, again... Uh, just a beautiful attention to detail. There are no squeaks. Look, there's lovely uh, lights on every step. Um, and then you've got this gorgeous window that just, it's a beautiful feature in the center of your saloon. Uh, you've got this uh, Chinese puzzle table there. I'm not sure if you've seen that in other videos where it opens up 50 ways from Sunday. So again, it'll go into a lovely coffee table when you don't need that space taken up by a big table, but you can also turn it very nicely into a dining table. Look at this. Look at this. He's got, oh my gosh, he's got storage under the steps uh, and they're all sealed in beautifully. Uh, he's thought of everything here. Again, it, it's just such a well thought out vessel. Um, in your master hall, beautiful little settee. I love the settees. Uh, just gives a sense of elegance. You know what? The more I look at this boat, the more I'm talking myself into one because there's just so much to love about what he has done. Look at that pull-out TV. Absolutely fantastic. As you head on back, uh, the size of this fantastic master bath is exceptional. Um, lots of space, a double sink, uh, you know, and you know, I wish our friends at Neil would take a lesson from this, even if they don't want to use the counter space. Uh, Tamash has got a double sink in a small area. Look at this. Perfect place for the laundry. Absolutely perfect. Doesn't take up key areas, uh, sealed away nicely and very accessible. If I've got my uh, Fowleys in there, uh, they can quickly go in for a dry, that sort of thing. Look at this almost walk-in area, uh, storage space. I mean, obviously, uh, this was not Utremer who designed this. Tomash uh, prefers to see all his ladies fully dressed, obviously, as opposed to my French friends. Uh, lots of space for clothing and storage. So well done. Um, you know, when you look around this now, I, I, I wasn't a fan of the upholstery here. There's a little too much wrinkle in that. I'd like to see that pulled out. I'd like to see some... Um, contrasting piping. I'd like to see some diamond stitching. 
Okay, this. Now, this is the Solar 60 Power, designed by none other than Bill Dixon, who I spent the afternoon with he and his son after doing this. And um, sometime in the next five years, that same gorgeous design will be applied to the X5. And that's a time when all my dreams will be made true, and uh, I will go running over to Tomash with my uh, certified check in hand. Uh, but even I might do it before then because he's just done so much to this. Look at even the detail on his table here uh, where you've got a carved in map of the world. I mean, there are so many beautiful elements to his design and thoughtful touches. You, you just can't help but absolutely love what the man has done. Uh, I mean, even down to the uh, faux teak, uh, look at the beautiful uh, machined grate there as you walk in. And uh, again, coming back to that fantastic window uh, to the underside, it just looks so beautiful. Now, here's his team. There's Tomash himself and his team. That smile, those people, they, they are exactly the way they look. Absolutely wonderful. Okay, looking at pre-owned comparables. Up first, we're looking at an exquisite X5 uh, 2020, so a uh, three, two, three-year-old boat now. We're looking at uh, comparable uh, for a new X5 Plus is base plus 100,000 or 1.8 million USD. Uh, they're asking 1.4 uh, for this two, three-year-old uh, exquisite X5. Um, that's 400 grand. Uh, it would be tough, but... I would probably go with the new one simply because I want a certain kind of wood trim and I really do like those aft panels on the Bimini. Next up is a 2020 HH, a two-year-old uh, HH. They're looking 2.2 versus 1.8. Well, these are two completely different boats. Both exceptionally high quality. It would totally depend on what my requirements are. I'd probably be with Tamash's. Uh, next up is a 2022 Leopard 50. Uh, so two-year-old, uh, one-year-old boat, less than one-year-old boat at 1.5 million USD versus 1.8 for the new uh, X5 Plus. I would, oh, this would be a hard one. I know that the X5 is a better quality boat with higher levels of features, but there's the aspect of the forward walk-through cockpit, the uh, uh, flying lounge, and various other elements on the Leopard, uh, plus, you know, a, a $300,000 savings. Oh, I don't know. This one I, I would really have to think hard about. I would lean towards the X5. Next up, we're looking at a 2020 Sunreef, a uh, two-year-old Sunreef. They're asking uh, 2.169, 2.2 versus 1.8. Um, the Sunreef is a completely different kind of vessel. Uh, you wouldn't have the sailing performance in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I would go with the uh, X5. Next up, we're looking at a fresh Fountain Peugeot Aura 51, uh, less than a year old. They're looking uh, for 1.825 versus 1.8 for a brand new uh, uh, X5. Um, again, there's so many aspects of this similar to the Leopard that I really, really like. Uh, which way would I go if I'm really thinking about safety uh, and comfort? For Sylvia, uh, I, I'd have to lean towards the X5. And really, the only reason I'm hesitating at all on the exquisite is the aesthetic of the exterior design. If this was uh, the, uh, the new design uh, that they have on the solar sail, I would be there in a heartbeat. We wouldn't even be having a hesitation here. Next up, we are looking at the Naughty Tech 542. You know this is one of my favorite yachts in all the world. It is a three-year-old boat. They're looking at 1.35 versus 1.8. I'm afraid on this one, it's the Naughty Tech 542 that would win. Uh, the aesthetic, the room, everything. Monohull Heresy. How do we compare this to a monohull? Well, as you know, we tag on 20% to the length to get the same livable area. 
And we are looking here at an oyster. Uh, it's a three-year-old oyster for 2.6 versus uh, 1.8. Uh, for the exquisite, I would go the exquisite, even though I freaking love oysters. Next up is the Beneteau uh, 62, a 2021. They're looking for 1.2 versus 1.8. Uh, if we exclude the heel, I would probably do the Beneteau 62 on this one. Next up, we're looking at a 2018 or a four-year-old Nature Swan 60. Um, and they're looking for 1.972. Without a doubt, I would do the exquisite at 1.8. Next up is the Dufour 61, a 2022, almost brand new. They're asking 1.5 versus 1.8. For the new exquisite, I would spend the money and go with the exquisite. Uh, and next up, we've got a Genoa 64, four-year-old, 64-foot luxury yacht at a million one versus 1.8. This one, I'd have to think long and hard. That's 700,000 US dollars. I'd probably go with the Genoa 64. Okay, the Dave score. How did she do? Well, we've gathered up a lot of yachts on the Dave score, but if we zoom in here, you can see she did extremely well. Uh, looking at elegance on the interior. Now, I, I had to do this based on the trims that I saw. These, uh, the elegance on the interior could pop up easy two points, depending, say, we did a, a lovely walnut or, or a, uh, a, a, a gloss maple or something more to my taste. Uh, but we're looking at six here with that bleach stuff. The exterior, about a six. Um, you, you, you don't have the forward cockpit. You don't have the fly lounge. Uh, but wow, do you ever have a massive aft cockpit. Um, and then comfort seven on the interior, I, I would prefer more access up each side of the, the berth or in a thwart ship. Uh, but uh, on the exterior, again, seven, uh, everything that is there is absolutely fantastic. Uh, but it is missing a fly lounge or a, or a forward uh, cockpit. Quality, this has got to be a nine. The, the, you can feel the quality in this boat. Uh, and he's thought of everything and included everything. Performance, a solid seven. Um, when you look at it in comparison to other boats and its weight. Lazy Sailor, absolutely a nine. He has automated everything that can be automated with the best of the best equipment. Uh, so this could easily be single-handed and Sylvia would not have a care in the world. Uh, condo, I'm going to give it a solid seven, maybe even an eight. Uh, Geek, eight for sure. There's There are cool, cool elements to this boat. And value for money, I'm going to give it an eight and it's rare I go over a seven. So this goes to 74 out of 100, uh, putting it right in there with balance and uh, uh, the big Lagoon 55, um, the HH 44s, uh, that sort of area, which is exactly where it belongs. But I'm telling you, if uh, he gets that Bill Dixon design on this, uh, that number is going to be raised way up in this chart. For our Art of the Region this week, we have Errol Boyle's Fishing. Errol Boyle was a well-known South African landscape painter who primarily worked with oil paint. He was born in East London, South Africa on the 31st of May 1918 and studied at the South African School of Arts. After completing his studies, he began a career as a commercial artist which he pursued for several years before turning to painting. Uh, Boyle's uh, painting often depicts beautiful and tranquil scenes of South Africa countryside with a particular focus on the Eastern Cape region. He was a master at capturing the unique light and color of the African landscape and his works were highly sought after by collectors both in South Africa and abroad. Boyle's career spans several decades during which he produced a large body of work that has become highly regarded in the art world. He passed away on September the 1st, 1993, but his legacy as a talented painter and artist lives on. Many of his paintings can be found in private collections as well as in museums gal and galleries throughout South Africa and beyond. Well, that's our Waves, Wine, Art and Ideas for this week. I do hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you 
get a sense of my respect and appreciation for Tomash and the exquisite team. This group have built a company uh, based on quality and inclusiveness and technology and thoughtful detail, and it's showing in the, in the speed in which they're expanding. Uh, I wish them the absolute very best, and I look forward to that next uh, X5 design and uh, hopefully I'll be running over there with a certified check for you. Thank you so much. Have a great week and we'll see you next week. Cheers.